everybody for coming. Uh, my name is Haley, and I'm a printmaking artist. Uh, I teach the basic drawing, uh, printmaking, and then the mural painting class right now. Uh, I want to remind everybody before we begin to make sure you sign in uh, the sign-in sheet if you're here for Art Forum. Uh, there's also the First Friday Passport. That's right next to the sign-in sheet as well for you to grab. Um, you want to make sure you sign in so that way I can know that you attended uh, the Art Forum today and Marky was present. And if you are enrolled in Art Forum and you don't see your name on the list, please let me know so that way I can add you. Uh, just a reminder too that students are required to attend the full lecture to receive the art form credit, so please stay till the end. Um, while James is speaking, uh, please think of any questions that you have uh, for him. There may be an opportunity after the lecture for you to ask those questions. And I also want to let you know that we are recording the lecture, um, so that will be... Maybe. Maybe. We're recording it. <laughs> I also want to remind everybody to please silence their phones uh, out of respect for um, our lecturer, James. And I also want to thank everybody who helped set up our venue today for the Art Forum Lecture. So let's give a round of applause for them. <laughs> awesome. And before uh, we move on, uh, do any ESU art students have any art program related announcements? Yep. Hello, my name is Kale. Um, I'm like the last instructor for this year. Um, we're going to get the glass field back going. And on Wednesday, this coming Wednesday, we're going to have a glass field meeting at 3 o'clock down in the art annex. Um, anybody is welcome to attend. Um, 3 o'clock next Wednesday. Are there any other announcements? Yeah. All right. So to introduce our speaker, uh, James Ellers was born and raised in Lake Charles, Louisiana. He earned his MFA from the University of Florida and is currently the interim dean of the School of Visual Arts, Visual and Performing Arts, and the Don and Mary Glasser Professor of Engraving Arts at Emporia State University in Kansas, the only school in the nation to offer a BFA with a concentration in engraving arts. Since 2007, he has given numerous engraving workshops at various events, including the Frogman's Printmaking Workshop in South Dakota, Impact Printmaking Conferences in Dundee, Scotland, and Bristol, England, MAPC in Minnesota, that's Mid-American Print Council, and uh, universities around the country. He has participated in a total of 170 exhibitions across the country internationally, including Bulgaria, Canada, Denmark, Poland, Portugal, Norway, Romania, the Republic of Macedonia, Turkey, and across the United States. There are currently 44 listed firearms engraving guild master engravers, and he is the only tenured professor in the United States to hold this title. So I'd like to give a warm welcome to James Ellers. Um, for his All right, everybody. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for being here. Uh, first, I want to give a, a few things. There's a lot of people to thank for uh, putting this together. Uh, first off, I want to thank Emporia First Friday, Trox Gallery, uh, Kayla Mock for, and, and Joel for making this happen. Um, their, their story, uh, Kayla's story, is, is a success story. Uh, we're very proud of her. She's, a, she's an art alum from ESU, done some great things afterwards, done some great things for this community. Can everyone hear me okay? <laughs> uh, and not only that, but congratulations to the community too, because it takes y'all to make these things happen, right? So, so I look at what the community, community's participation as a, a success story as well. Um, so. It's vital that we have community members uh, participating in these types of events or, or any type of event, creative art event. Um, I want to thank the Lyon County History Center for sponsoring this event and uh, letting us use this really cool space. Uh, and thanks to the businesses that, that allow us to promote uh, our events in their spaces. Um, 
most, re most recently, um, thanks to Union Street Social and Mulready's for letting us promote on their menu screens. That's pretty cool. Um, and I also want to thank the Art Forum Committee. There's a lot of work that, that goes into putting this together as a, as a program that's been retooled. And, and that committee uh, is Haley Quick, who was just up here speaking. She's the, uh, our new public art person. So we're going to see some, some more uh, public art coming up. That's really exciting. Uh, Derek Wilkinson, the, our, our painter, who's back there. Um, Stephanie Alanis over there, who's our gallery and outreach director. Uh, and Kayla Mock is also on the committee to help out uh, with promoting and getting spaces sorted out. So, so thanks to the group for making that happen. And um, <laughs> and thanks to my wife right here, Fran. <laughs> Okay, well, well, we've been doing art form for uh, 30 plus years. I haven't been here 30 plus years, but it's going on, been going on for a long time here. And it's been offered at three o'clock on Wednesday on campus, which makes it uh, rather prohibitive for, uh, for the community to participate in that. Um, it's always been public, but obviously the time was challenging. So we knew that there was interest in having lectures um, in part of exhibitions that happened as part of uh, the first Friday Art Walk. So, um, we're really excited to, to put these together. So it'll be an opportunity for, for students, prospective students and the community as a whole to, to be a part of it. And we will be launching a, a, a fundraising opportunity uh, to bring in speakers from all over the country here uh, to give workshops, prolonged stays. Uh, so we'll be posting about that on our, on our social channels, on our Instagram page and our, and our uh, Facebook page. Uh, so be on the lookout for that. And also as the Dean of, uh, interim Dean of the School of Visual and Performing Arts, I do want to say uh, to the Emporia community that we want, we want you to know us. And this is partly why we're doing this. We want to be more engaged with the community. We want you to know the creative activities of music, theater, and art. And we are actively working to expand this presence in the downtown community. But we also want you to feel welcome and energized to come on campus and see the creative talent and the activities that we have going on. There's a lot of hardworking and dedicated, talented folks that teach in those areas. Um, and these folks are very invested in the success of their students. And um, it's been great getting to know all of them. They're amazing people. Um, and it's, it's a fa truly fascinating group of people to get to know and work with. So every month is a great month on campus to check out what's going on. But I will tell you, October is a really awesome month to see stuff on campus. So I'm going to put my little plug in now for that. ESU is the Emporia First Friday uh, presenting venue in October, October 6th. We're going to have music and exhibitions in Beach Hall. We're going to have the faculty show, a mural painting activity in King Hall. And we're going to have uh, glass forming going on down in the annex, right? Uh, and then other activities that are they're going to come up as well. Oh, wait, there's more. <laughs> October 7th. October 7th. The music gala, the, the big scholarship fundraiser, the day after, if that wasn't enough, one of the best guitar players in the world is coming onto this campus to play. Um, mark this on your calendars, mark both days on your calendars, um, but this, this is something to not miss, so please be there for that. Oh, it gets even better, right? We have, uh, we have a theater production at the end of that month, Little Shop of Horrors musical. It's gonna be incredible. Um, so please mark your calendars for that. So we have, I know the text is kind of small, but trust me, you'll, this isn't gonna be the first time you see this stuff. We're gonna be plugging it quite a bit, just putting it in your brains right now. Okay, so we have four opportunities to see that. All right. So this evening, 
I want to take a, talk a little bit about my artistic journey, my exhibition, which is downstairs, uh, not downstairs in this building, but downstairs over there in Trox. Um, so I have a solo exhibition there that we planned a year ago. Um, there'll be thoughts on my outlook on, on life and just how I navigate life, and that informs the work. There'll be some religious stuff, some philosophy, talking about mortality, social commentary, and some not so heavy stuff too, I promise, right? Uh, but this is the ride we're about to go on, so here we go, all right? So a little bit about me, where I'm from. Uh, Lake Charles, Louisiana, so you can see on the bottom right, that's, that's my family that's down there, all having dinner down there. Um, I'm a first generation college student, so there's a, I was fairly ignorant to a lot of things to go into the college experience, but obviously I survived. I'm the only person in my immediate family with a, with a college degree. Uh, my father was a, or is a uh, commercial printer, so I grew up in that kind of environment, worked in, worked in that space for a while, did graphic design for two years, and did marketing there for two years. Uh, so that's kind of inform, informed some of my, um, some of my thought process. Uh, and then those were, as was mentioned, the degrees and the titles that I've had and what I am now. So in this journey, whenever, <laughs> when I started undergrad, I had no idea what I was gonna do. Like maybe a lot of people, completely confused, lost. I was in college for about a year and a half. Um, didn't know what I was gonna do. Was about ready to join the military. And then I got talked into taking a drawing class and I didn't even know you could take a drawing class. <laughs> so, so I took a drawing class and I took a drawing class with, with this gentleman, Jerry Wubin. And he, he talked me into uh, taking a, a printmaking class. It's like, if you draw really well, you probably like taking a printmaking class. So the first, the first uh, semester I took, uh, or that particular semester I took um, etching, line etching. And uh, I, I hated it and swore I'd never do it again. And then one day I come into class and this print was on the wall, drawing. And it's this, you know, it's this abstract landscape. And I remember seeing it, just being completely mesmerized by it. I just couldn't stop looking at it. And I asked him, how did you do that? And so you see there's some kind of blobs that are going on there. That's lift ground etching, which is a a convoluted explanation I'm not going to go into, but you see all the line work, that calligraphic kind of dynamic mark making that's on there, that's all engraved. So I asked him, say, how did you do that? And he demoed it, and I couldn't do it uh, to save my life, um, and, but I wanted to learn how to do it, so I obsessed about it, and I worked in a movie theater at the time. Does anyone have a movie theater job in here or had one? It's awesome. <laughs> There's a lot of downtime between movies, so I would practice engraving, and then the next semester, that's what I did, and that's what I did in the entire undergrad was engrave. I just became obsessed with it. Um, very supportive, amazing uh, person. I uh, was lucky to have had him as an undergrad professor, and a uh, very, very inspiring person. And then I worked with Oscar Gillespie at Bradley, who had a completely different style of engraving. Of, of engraving. Um, he's a very uh, clean intaglio printer, uh, very particular about uh, his bevels, for example. So if anyone sees the bevels in my work, that's what I, I, I kind of picked that up from him. And I learned about a lot about cross-hatching and composition and, and conceptual elements from him as well. Um, still friends with both of these, these folks. And I just, uh, I'm very grateful that I'm still able to talk to them and work with them. And, and yeah, they're just, they're just two amazing people. So that's kind of the outline of my creative output that I'm gonna go into as we're moving forward in this. And um, you know, one thing that I did wanna talk about, I always, some folks kind of get t nervous talking about art and what art is supposed to be, and, and um, maybe they get nervous uh, kind of going into it, and it really doesn't need to be a scary or, or intimidating thing at all, right? So. I um, just want to share a few of my thoughts on that. So, you know, I see, you know, art in the creative process has a different function for a lot of people. 
and you can go down in, into any any number of galleries and you can see that you can see that on the wall you can see that there's different interests there's different reasons for art making there's different things that you're attracted to and they all they're all valid for whatever reason right so some things you're going to like and some things you're not going to like and that's just how it is but i would say that it's it is worthwhile to either ask or really ponder what do you think the intent of the artist was even especially especially when you don't like it i think that's really worth asking um, and there's been plenty of situations where I had that same question where I was jarred by a piece of work that the experience I didn't quite like and then later on it's like you know what that makes sense um, so I understand there's kind of that knee-jerk um, reaction oftentimes but I do think it's worth asking and pondering and you know what you have the right to change your mind right you all have the right to change our opinions on things when we become more informed that's just the life thing, right? So what got me into making art was allegory. So, <clears throat> you know, um, sometimes some things are really hard to talk about in the work, and I use making work as a, as a visual expression of my thoughts. So when you see at least my work, it's a it's a it's a visual conversation that I'm having with you, and it's a symbolic one, and and it's obviously a one-way conversation, right? Because the work can't talk back unless you track me down. Again. Um, and I'm sharing my thoughts with you. Maybe it makes sense to you. Maybe it doesn't. Maybe it'll make sense to you later, right? So there's some there's some work that I've seen at a different time, or even music, or any type of art that I've heard later, I'm like, now that makes sense to me. And that's just part of the, part of the aesthetic experience is our palettes are evolving as we get older, right? Um, the other thing is, as an artist, I don't necessarily feel I have to be committed to a certain subject matter or technique, so I kind of run around. I mean, I have a cohesive body of work that's down in the gallery, and then cohesive body of work I'm gonna show you. But I have a very non-cohesive body of work that I'm also going to show you uh, a little bit later. So I think expanding um, your artistic process is worthwhile in doing and uh, selling out, I guess, uh, to expand your technique um, and your opportunities, especially your commission opportunities to make some money, um, are also worth doing, right? So. Now there are, I'm just gonna have like a few quotes I'm not really gonna go that far into, but these are very impactful um, quotes from either books or places that I've heard before that have stayed with me and I think are like the philosophical underpinning of my work and just my overall thought process. This is a quote from uh, Nietzsche's Thus Spoke Zarathustra. Is anyone familiar with that book? It's an amazing, it's Nietzsche's only allegorical, allegorical narrative, well worth reading. But I picked up this book randomly and decided to just open it. And I was in, also working at the movie theater. And, uh, and this, the first uh, aphorism that I read in there was on the tree on the mountainside. And this is a quote that's from it. And it really made me ponder like the, the internal struggle and the idea of my thoughts being my, mo my own worst enemy. The thing, that, the, the thing I feared came upon me, um, that is from Job. And how, this, how, how I came upon this quote actually uh, was not from reading the Bible, it was from researching the law of attraction. Anyone familiar with that? So I was just Googling the law of attraction. Probably about a decade ago. I was really stressed out. And, uh, and this video came up where this person <coughs> was talking about that, this quote from Job. And about that idea of whenever you obsess about something bad that's going to happen the odds of you manifesting it increase 
right? So who's, nobody in here does that, right? <laughs> anyway, it made me think about that and it, and it really tried to be, make me be observant of my thoughts. Um, so that is a bit of an underpinning into the work as well. And this is from Zen Buddhism. Uh, when a thought arises, don't attach yourself to it. That idea of just obsessing about the same thing over and over again and then just becoming consumed by it. And then it affects your temperament. It affects how you interact with people. It just overall affects you spiritually and can put you in a really negative space. You know, why can't we just obsess about good things? Right. <laughs> so anyway, um, so th those are kind of the three major kind of impactful things that, that, that I think about and influence a lot of my work. So uh, the line of work that I'm going to start with, the earliest I'm going to go in is to 2017, because I think it would be worth at least showing that late up to where we're doing now. Uh, so you can kind of get a sense of how things evolve. So for a while, I've been doing a lot of pieces that were a reaction about how social media has affected social dynamics and how that affects people's thoughts, how it affects my own thoughts, and the irony of these platforms that were intended to bring people together doing the exact opposite. Um, so I started making these toxic Twitter birds, these zombie kind of looking Twitter birds, uh, and integrating them in some of the works. You can see our, our little toxic Twitter bird on the bottom left here. And a lot of these pieces are influenced by old master printmakers like Albrecht Durer, you can look him up. Um, but I am influenced considerably by Renaissance printmakers. Uh, this is obviously about conflict, and we can find all types of symbolism and political symbolism uh, within this. That little house in the background is actually a Thomas Kincaid house. Any Thomas, any, any Thomas Kincaid fans in here? No? Okay. Uh, so yeah, it's a dilapidated Thomas Kincaid house in the background. And we have our, our little angry Twitter bird delivering another message make people mad. Uh, I was also interested in that idea of being, all of us being cell phone users and being complicit in surveillance culture, because we're all surveilling with our phones just by default. Um, so we can kind of see these figures down in the, in the background space all playing on their phones. We have a little surveillance snake at the bottom. And this composition is taken from a Durer woodcut that I've replaced the angels with these Twitter birds. And then I took the head from 1984, like the poster from the movie, and just put it on there so he's the big brother character. And then I was also interested in the psychology of what happens whenever you proactively look for things that make you mad. Has anyone done that? Has anyone rage surfed? <laughs> I don't see every hand going up in here. Um, and you know, and I've caught myself doing it, like just actively looking for something that's gonna irritate me. I was like, what are you doing? Um, and just kind of being stuck in that cycle, and again, it just affecting your temperament and really putting you in a bad headspace and, and how you treat and judge people around you. And it's just, yeah, it's not a good thing. Uh, so that's uh, what I was thinking whenever I, I, I uh, produced this one, just kind of locked into doing that. And then I thought a lot about how how social media or our phones are actually used in our day-to-day -day lives. It's kind of like a pacifier. 
How many of you have been in a line, in a line at a coffee shop, and you didn't know anyone, and you pulled out your phone because you were stressed out, because you didn't want to talk to anybody? There should be more hands going up in here. Um, so that, that idea of, of using that as a tool just to, to do mindless scrolling to provide some type of escapism from an uncomfortable moment. And then what does that do to your resilience whenever you're not, you're not willing to face uncomfortable moments? So I thought of the parallel between just phone addiction to alcohol addiction. So you could easily just change the title to maybe if I keep scrolling, it'll go away. Okay, uh, so this is just a small block of work uh, that I'm gonna talk a little, little bit about here. Uh, and this is, a lot of this is obviously uh, some, some of the work that was produced when the <coughs> pandemic hit and, and visually how I responded to that. Um, the first piece I'm gonna go into here, it's, that's not 2020, it's 2014, I understand, but there's a reason. Um, I made this in 2014 and it's an infectious disease monster. So each one of those heads of the, of the creature is some type of, uh, is an animal that carries a, a particular infectious disease. Um, and the title of it is BSL two through four nonpartisan vectors. Uh, Fran helped me with that title. I didn't know what BSL was and I forever wouldn't remember it until the pandemic happened. Does anyone know what BSL means? Biosafety level. So biosafety level four is for like really intense things like Ebola. Uh, what was bi what was COVID? Is that two? Maybe it's three. Anyway, um, so all of these characters are run that particular gamut. And I distinctly remember I was at Fresno State and they were printing this for me. I was a visiting artist and they were printing this for me and I was talking about this piece. And I was like, well, where did this come from? And I'm so, well, partly it came out of frustration because I remember at the time um, there was there was this uh, Ebola scare. I don't know if anyone remembers that. Does anyone remember that? Okay, I think there was like maybe two cases. And it was in Texas, if I remember right. But, but and that's a terrifying disease. If anyone's ever read about it, it's absolutely terrifying. Um, but the way that it was being covered was like, Ebola is coming for you and it's knocking at your door. And it just seems so alarmist to me that I remember telling them, one day something really bad's going to happen. And because of this, no one's going to believe them. So that's why I put this here. <laughs> so like many people, didn't know how to respond. I mean, we're all just trying to figure it out and move as quickly as we can and being proactive and, and with, with whatever happened, right? So once I got my stuff set up for my students, students are number one, get what they need and adapt to the best of my ability. All I could think of was just me just make stuff. And not only that, just make stuff, it doesn't have to be good. Just make stuff. So usually I plan a lot of stuff out. In this case, I didn't. I just like, all right, let's let her rip. Let's just do it. So um, this was, I did a bunch of these. I'm just gonna show a few of them. This is whenever initially, as we're learning about the disease, because remember we knew nothing, <laughs> um, about not being able to recognize a carrier Uh, this piece is about making videos at home. So let me see the arrow right here. See, there's a little camera right here, toilet paper roll, makeshift prop from, to hold up the camera. There's the big brother face right there. Um, and then all types of terror going on outside. And all types of weird little symbolism going on there. And then Fran, um, was making masks like 
how many, do you remember how many masks you made? <laughs> About 200. She was a sewing machine. It was incredible and it was admirable to watch. Um, and I was super proud of her. But uh, one day I, I came in and there was this little pin cushion that she had made. And the way that the light was hitting it, I wanted to do a rendering of it. So this is, this is a little, this is an homage to my wife and the work that she was doing during the pandemic. And uh, then, you know, we all, we all saw the kind of, the, the way that things were covered, they would be so extreme in either direction that it's like, I don't know, it's like we're, we're just confusing everyone, freaking everybody out. We don't know what to believe anymore. Um, stressing everyone out. Um, and the, the nature of the title is to express that kind of contradictory um, thought process th uh, throughout that experience. It's like very complicated. So once that once I moved on from that, um, I didn't want to work, make work about that. I was just making work to cope with what was going on at the time and plan to make like, some big COVID series. It was just to survive during that time. Did any, any, anyone make anything during? No, we will chat later. Um, uh, so we get. So I wanted to move on from making work like that. <clears throat> and whenever you're in visual arts and you get some success doing some type of work, or I guess any type of creative art, you get scared to do something else. You, you're like, I had some success doing that. Not that I had success with that COVID stuff, but the stuff before I was doing pretty good. Um, but I knew I didn't want to do that anymore. I just moved on from it. So this, is, this was initially a still life set up for my drawing class. And we still had the social distance. And so I just brought in, I was just trying to get some stuff together, grab a skull, put some stuff in its eye, stuffed its mouth, put it on top of an Amazon, Amazon uh, shipping box. Set it up, ready to go. And I kept drawing it. I kept drawing it. And I kept drawing it. I must have drawn it six times. And then I told myself, you know you can engrave this if you want to keep drawing it. So it's, it's like, but I don't know where it's going. You know you can do it anyway. So instead of my normal have everything figured out, I just did it. And the strange, and this was the springboard to all the work that I have. I was glad I took the risk to do that. Because I feel like I got some pretty cool work after that. And the odd thing about it is, out of all the work I'm going to show you right now, this is the one that gets in the jury shows the most. I've gotten this one alone, and I think six jury shows uh, across the country. So it's kind of funny how that works out. No planning. Let's just figure it out. Let's just take the risk. So this newest body of work that kind of came from this it's a, a, a react, really a reaction to what I'm seeing, the time, the space that I'm in. And, and for me, that means my experience as an academic, both the trials and the comforts of being a middle-aged person. Um, and in the wake of the pandemic, there has been an overall national awakening of priorities of how we live our lives. Um, <clears throat> mortality. Facing fears, stress management, those are all part of, part of the work that I'm doing. And all of this is done through a traditional visual interpretation, utilizing uh, the Vanita's approach to still life. So typically that would involve a skull and some other visual <coughs> device to imply time, the passage of time. Um, so you'll see that in, in the rest of these. <laughs> and I throw in emojis in a lot of them, and those are our modern hieroglyphs. Uh, utilized in a lot of the work to just to convey the temporality of emotion 
and uh, the reference of the disconnect from what's actually in front of us because emojis aren't in front of us. This made me think of, uh, you know, I was thinking a lot about how, particularly Facebook, it, I feel like it's a landmine. Of, of, I very rarely comment on anything on them uh, because I just don't want to deal with it. Uh, but just feeling like often like I have to walk on eggshells whenever I'm posting anything or commenting on anything. Because there's, there's, sometimes it feels like that there, there's sometimes a space for folks to actively think the worst in anything that you post or write, that you have the worst intent. Um, and that's a very stressful thing. So I just kind of lay off of it, but that's what, that's what inspired this piece. And we can see our little emoji friends right here. Mr. Happy, he thinks that's hilarious. And Mr. Angry. And this is a still life of setup of objects that are just in my everyday space. So these are all things that are just in my kitchen. That I set up to create this, and I was thinking a lot, thinking a lot about just being present. How often are we not present? Our minds are trailing off into other things, and I don't think phones are really helping with that. The ability to focus is a really special thing because you don't get any of it back. You don't get any moments back. Once it's gone, it's gone. Period. Uh, and just trying to be mindful of um, of those moments and the friends and people that I have around me and the experiences that I have. Um, so that's in the, the, the backdrop of all this work, but particularly this one, because there's a lot of everyday habits that are in this one. Um, I drink a lot of smoothies, so I have a lot of bananas here. My phone, some tape, every artist needs tape. And then that's a uh, paper mache flower that my wife made for our wedding, so I still have those. It's a detailed shot here. You can see all the cross hatching that he did on him. Mashed potatoes. <laughs> it's the most ridiculous title for this piece, but as soon as I called it that, I couldn't call it anything else. One of the things that I thought a lot about when I was creating this one, and this is loaded with symbolism, is that idea of pushing forward, being resilient through adversity. How are you going to react through adversity? When things get hard, how are you going to react? Um, and I, I think about that just in general, as well as I always ask myself that when things get really hard. Uh, and sometimes I do well and sometimes I don't. But on this particular one, so we have our, little, our skull here looking up towards the future. And then we have our dollop of potatoes smashed on the face. Angry, angry mashed potatoes smashed on the face. Major distraction from what you're trying to get done in your life. Right? Distractions. Taking out, taking out focus. <clears throat> that was like the, the primary thought process between uh, in, in creating this one. And there's a few other little items I'll point out here. Like this is a, these are leaves of spinach. I put leaves of spinach in my smoothies along with bananas. So you're starting to see the theme here. Um, and then that's a whiskey cork. So that kind of jumping forth between that balance between good habits and bad habits. So this was just about trying to be resilient through adversity. And I had made a sequel. <laughs> Never made a sequel to a print before. Um, but I did a drawing of this and I had it in the, the faculty show last year. And then there was a student, Dean, his name, Dean's back there. Dean told me that they thought this would be a cool engraving, so I took you up on it. Um, uh, 
Uh, so I decided that in the, the engraving and the drawing are downstairs in Trox if you want to look at them. Uh, but this is the opposite. This is kind of succumbing to it, succumbing to the pressure. I still have the same angry mashed potatoes face <coughs> on, on the head. And then down here, this is a ice cube, one of those large whiskey ice cubes. More bananas. Okay, so I'm going to go into uh, some of the technical stuff. So we do have uh, an engraving arts program in Emporia State. And you can see some of the tools here. This is, a, in, this is in the classroom. You can see some students working and actually using one of the tools to carve into a small plate here. This is a close-up of some of the tools. So we have a, a mixture of pneumatic tools and push tools. You see the pneumatic tools on the left, so it just kind of vibrates like a little jackhammer. And then the rest that just carved directly into the material. I brought some plates and some gravers down here, so if anyone wants to stick around, you can look at that, you can look through it. And here's a few student pieces. They do some really interesting things. And uh, the, the Fega Master thing was brought up. And I have, I've never had an ambition to do that. I just thought it would be an interesting challenge, technically, to see where I could go. So that's a completely foreign style of engraving. Um, so these are the requirements in order to get that, that particular status. So the, the Firearms Engraving Guild meets annually in Las Vegas in February, and then they jury in person. You have to bring the work in person. And there's a specific set of techniques that you're supposed to demonstrate. So uh, there's all these different styles of scroll work that you're supposed to demonstrate. Uh, there's rendering of text. Um, there's inlay, metal inlay. So this is a gold inlay. This is called a field inlay. And then down here, these are just inlays on the spine of, of the scroll. I have this piece here if anyone wants to see it. And you bring it in and you hope for the best. And <coughs> it worked out for me, so I got it that year. And that experience, I learned how to draw like that and I'd never been able to do that before. So it gave me the opportunity to do things that I wouldn't have done otherwise. So this is a medallion I did for President Garrett in 2016. And all of that is hand done. The text is all hands cut. That is not a laser machine that did that. Um, so, one of the few things it's like I did that. <laughs> it was really hard. <laughs> you don't have to. <laughs> Thank you, but uh, and I brought a casting of that as well. If anyone wants to see it. Uh, as anyone, I imagine everyone here knows about the race, bike race. Unbound gravel. Are you serious? It just takes over the town <laughs> for like an entire week. Okay, there's a major bike race here. It brings <laughs> people from all over the world. They ride 200 miles in the Flint Hills, some of them 350 miles. Anyway, make a prize for that race. And for, it's for the 200 milers, if they, if they finish before the sunset, which is incredibly fast, they get one of these. I've been doing this since 2013, so it's been a really great opportunity. And um, the last few years, I started adding animals, Kansas animals, to, the, to kind of celebrate, uh, celebrate the community, celebrate Kansas. And I thought it would be hilarious to put a turtle <laughs> on my bread. Uh, this turtle is a bit of a celebrity. Does anyone know what the pay rock is? Prophet. Okay, the Prophet uh, Aquatic Outreach. Somebody help me here. Thank you. Uh, this turtle is over there, so you can you can make an appointment for an audience with the turtle. So it's a little, little shy, but um, Turtleina is the name of the turtle. Uh, and being able to draw, knowing how to draw that particular style, it afforded me to do other types of things, do other types of experimentations. If uh, anyone's been on the back of uh, the bike shop, Merchant Cycles, 
you might recognize this design right here. It's a big painting of it in the back. Um, so this was a design for a jersey. And that's what it ended up. I, I did all the color for nothing, but it's cool. <laughs> it ended up looking better, black and blue and gray. And that's uh, Stephanie Lanter, our, the, the former ceramics instructor, rocking that out in the Flint Hills. And uh, being able to render in the style has also afforded me the ability to do these other types of projects. So this is in Gatlinburg, Tennessee at uh, Aramont School of Arts and Crafts. So Fran and I went out there and, and we painted this mural. And being, being uh, versatile in what I'm willing to do is also giving me opportunities to try other things. So you can see that I'm painting that piece back here. Uh, but I've been able to do other types of projects. Uh, some of you might have this shirt. <coughs> So if I wasn't able, if I didn't do the Fega Master thing, then I wouldn't really be drawing like that. Um, and just participating in, in other types of events. Uh, this is actually a, a student project, a collaborative one that we did for, for the race that they, the, the 5K race that they have here. Uh, does anyone remember the, the EVAC project, the, v, the veteran project show that was, okay, so. Um, that was at the Art Center maybe about five years ago, I think. Um, and I got to participate in that, and that was the work that I did for that up there. So I guess what's like, what I'm just trying to get at here is just because you're, you, you have like a specific body of work that you like to do, and that's a really good thing, you should be doing that. You need to expand and have opportunities and not feel like you're selling out um, to try other things to make money or have uh, other types of visual arts experiences and then just really expanding your work um, to get to do other things for people because I don't know that some of that other work would work well uh, with some of these other other types of projects I was presuming, pursuing. So I'm sure if I would have contacted Aramont with a bunch of skulls, they wouldn't have gone for it. Right? <laughs> so anyway, um, I want to thank everyone for coming out. Thank you all for being here. If you have any questions, that's cool. If you don't, you want to like get on to the art walk, get moving on, that's cool too. I think I'm at about time here. So if you want to hang out, come ask some stuff, or come look at some of the work over here, let me know. Are there any questions right off the bat here? James, you've been an administrator for about, what, three or four years now? Three, uh, two years. So, so how has is, how is that experience <coughs> maybe referenced some of the work that you have done after that? You've kind of taken us through a process. And my, my, my guess is that you have less time for art yeah. and uh, more time for other things that, that somebody else wants you to do. So how do you, how do you balance those things? That's a really good question, Ed. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, as a dean, I have not figured that out yet. Um, as a chair, I could figure it out. Uh, so um, what I was doing was I getting up really early and get to school really early. And I ended up changing a lot of my working process to where I wouldn't fuss nearly as much. But some of the earlier stuff, I fussed a lot about the compositions. Um, I used, and a, a lot of that stuff were composites of visual sources instead of having one visual source. So the still life is one visual source to work from. So I have it all set up. The longest part is actually setting it up and getting the outline on the plate. Once I get that, that done, the shading is it's like eating candy. That's easy. It's the, 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 the composition is the hard part. Yeah, but I'm, I'm working on it right now. I'll have to get back to you. <laughs> Anybody else? Back there? Where were you in Bulgaria? What's that? You said you went to Bulgaria. Where exactly were you? All those cool places that were listed off, the work went there. I didn't go there. <laughs> I went to some, some of those places, but I didn't get to go to that one. No. Oh, awesome.
Awesome. Awesome. I'll have to look up where the show actually was and I could tell you where the work went, not me. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I think of engraving as being like kind of you have the tiny little things you do that are aggressive for being small. And then you have larger scale stuff. Yeah. What would you say you prefer working with, like, getting really down, tiny on little digits and making impressive small scroll work? Do you like working big? That's a great question. Um, he asked if I like working big or, or working. <coughs> it really depends. The, the small scroll work pieces are, those are fun because I don't have to think a whole lot when I'm doing it. Um, because I get, I kind of get on autopilot when I'm working, and the designs seamlessly come out when I'm doing when I'm doing them, and that's just because I've done it enough times to where it'll just happen. And I'm not gonna say every scroll piece is like that, but a lot of them are. So I can put something down, and sometimes I'll just do this. I was like, I want to do something to just de-stress, and I'll put a pin it out, and then I'll just engrave on it. But. Um, but the large work, um, that is more of a journey. So the small pieces, that's like, get something done, feel good, I got something done. The large work is, I mean, it sounds so hokey, but it's like a spiritual journey to work on something really large. And I almost don't like it when the work is done, because now I have to think of something else to do. So I really enjoy the journey. Yeah. How did I start practicing? Uh, I just brought a, a little graver with me. There's little gravers over there. And I brought a little plate with me and I just made marks. I didn't even try to render anything. I just was like, how do I get this? How do I get the, the metal out of this? How do I just even get a line out of this? So it just took a lot of a lot of practice to do that. And if anyone who's had my engraving class, show of hands who's endured my engraving class, thank all of you. Um, but all of them can attest that's how they start, actually. They start by cutting off of the edge of the plate just to, just to get acclimated to how to put the angle in to remove the metal. be a musician. Anybody else? We good? One, oh, two He's more. actually an amazing guitar player, and so GE is a music great musician. Thank you, Arthur. So with that, <laughs> how does music inspire your, your work as a new Or did it just, I mean, you just are so close to the time. Um, <coughs> if it does, yeah. it doesn't have to. Oh, I just, um, has anyone heard of the band Wing to Victory for the Sullen? Mm -hmm. You know that? Mm -hmm. That's my soundtrack. For real, if, like in my reels, I, I put that. It's probably the world's most depressing music, but, <laughs> but um, I'm not sure. I, I feel like, I don't think it's depressing. I think it's really spiritual music, but um, I'm not really sure it's a good question. I'm not sure how to answer it, though. It, do you have a question? I'm sorry, I can't hear you. What kind of music do I play? Well, uh, I play all kinds. Um, I started off as metal, playing metal. Uh, so Metallica is what got me into playing music. The first song I learned how to play was For Whom the Bell Tolls. Um, and I was really into Steve Vai and Slayer and Megadeth and all kinds of family-friendly music. And, um, <laughs> and then I started getting into classical and probably my all-time guitar here is Randy Rhodes, Ozzy Osbourne, Randy Rhodes. 
Um, but I listen to all kinds of stuff. I thought that's just kind of what got me into it. Jazz, love jazz. There's some awesome jazz musicians in the music program. Oh my God. Anybody else? Speaking of jazz musicians, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Just thinking of kind of the corollary between writing music and the piece of visual art. When you start, any one of those engravings that you did, did you have sort of a, a good idea of what the finished product was going to be? And did you conform the vision to that? Or is your process more organic? Like you get a germ of an idea and sort of unfolds. That's a really good question. Um, so I'd say that my, my earlier work was a lot more organic. And I, I shifted to doing a little bit of planning and then the rest of the And then the newest work is all planned out. Um, and part of that, part of that is to, uh, actually to, to what Ed brought up a while ago. Um, as, as uh, and Ed might be able to attest to this, being in, a, in the administrative position, I get sometimes get problem solving fatigue and, um, and art is problem solving. So if I can figure out everything right off the bat uh, with that particular work, I'm, I find that get all that done, have it all sorted out, don't have anything hanging around and have to figure out later, and then just go with it. So I've actually had to adapt because of my role. And my guess one So for something very ornate and kind of formal like the President's Medal, yeah. did you start with an actual sketch with it, like a template, and then you engraved, or was that freeform? Oh, that was 100% planned out. Absolutely, that all was. But there's there's some other pieces that, I, that I'll have up here I didn't have photos of that I just drew on the plate and let them happen. Um, but I don't know if they, like, okay, here's a good example. I'll put this one back up. That one, that's a good example of one that just organically happened. So that's like a good free flow, let's have some fun, take some risks, see what happens uh, kind of piece. But yeah, that was 100% fine that. able to identify with I mean that's that's I mean that's great but I'm honestly I think that's something I thought a lot more about in graduate school um, and as I as I've gotten older I'm just trying to make stuff and respond to 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 my environment and um, and you know there's some times where I didn't think about that and made some work that Visually, probably didn't land as, as well as I had hoped for. I don't. I don't know that any of these are like that. I didn't put any of those in here. <laughs> but yeah, I've had a few problem problem ones. But that's a good question. Um, so at, at this point, um, I'm just trying to continue. I'm trying to be honest and sincere and make the most honest work that, at the end of the day, I feel good about because. I was honest. Anybody else? All right, everybody. Thank you so much. To support the ESU Art Forum program, please visit emporia.edu slash art. Click on the Events tab. Scroll down to the Art Forum link and click. Then scroll down to the Support Art Forum button and click. Finally, choose your donation level and click on the Continue button to complete the process. We appreciate your support.